video, we want to talk about ecological economics and what ecological economics can contribute to solutions for the climate crisis. Ecological economists consider the economy embedded in the large systems of society and the biosphere and try to develop ideas of how to build a system that is ecologically sustainable. The goal of ecological economics is to understand how we could achieve an economy that is within environmental limits and does not lead society to collapse through the, the lack of consideration of our interaction with the environment. The first important feature of ecological economics is the assumption of planetary boundaries that becomes evident when taking into account the laws of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics imply that our economy is a subsystem where material and energy resources can't be produced out of thin air, but are only converted. Before producing goods, resources have to be taken from the environment. For example, batteries require material and energy to work. And this often implies environmental damage, like deforestation or overfishing. After being used, products do not simply disappear, but either have to be recycled or turn into waste. So we characterize the economy not in terms of GDP or in terms of prices only, but we look at the, the kilos of materials that enter the economy, the joules of energy that they are entering the economy, the pollutants and the waste that exit, so it's a different metric system. Ecological economics analyzes the interaction between economy and the environment. For example, they develop models which take into account these aspects like planetary boundaries. Thereby, ecological economics recognizes that our knowledge about future natural and social systems is very uncertain. For example, we cannot say exactly who will suffer from the climate crisis in which moment. That's why they argue for the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle emphasizes the need to minimize the risk of potentially disastrous actions. The approach of ecological economics is based on a system perspective, looking at ecological and economic processes from the perspective of systems and less from the perspective of individuals. This allows a broad pluralistic spectrum of methods, which range from econometric and cost-benefit analysis to life cycle assessment and more qualitative methods. Now, the choice of methods depends on the context and the research question. It is one of the things we've been looking for for a long time is this idea of decoupling. And is it possible to maintain that growth while decreasing environmental impacts? One of the things we're seeing is that not only is decoupling not happening, but at the point we're really able to allocate responsibility for environmental pressures and environmental impacts on economic growth and more particularly on affluence itself. So not only is it, are these processes of damage really driven by economic growth, it's the affluent within each economy that are doing the most driving. And that's, I think, a really important insight. One of the main recommendations is the question of gain and that we have to set clear limits, uh, regulatory limits and international agreements on how to, on limiting the scale of the economic activity and the scale of pollution and resource extraction. This raises an intriguing question. What does a system look like that does not rely on growth? As part of ecological economics, the degrowth movement proposes a number of changes. People should work less, produce less and consume less, and instead engage in a world with less material products, but have more time to care for each other, repair products and learn. According to this idea, money should be redistributed to guarantee that everyone can satisfy their material needs with less working hours. Within ecological economics, it is highly debated to what extent the value of nature should be monetized. Some ecological economists suggest that ecosystems should be priced to take them into consideration. Others warn that the variety of values of nature cannot be reduced to a common measure. If we have a better conception of the environment, then we should also be able to value it and translate that value into economic terms. Or is it possibly detrimental because once you put a dollar things on things, you can sort of buy and sell and destroy it. I think we have to think a lot more in terms of political power. We're not suffering from a lack of good advice for governments. What we're suffering from is the understanding 
of why economic structures don't allow these governments to take up that advice.